Good morning, friends. My name is Gail Preston, and I'm a member of the Church Leadership Council and your lay leader here at Concord Trinity. We want to affirm, not label or alienate, but intentionally and joyfully embrace that no matter who you are, no matter your race or ethnicity, no matter where you're at on your faith journey, you are welcomed and wanted in this place. We're so glad you've come to spend time with us this morning in person or online. Now here at Conquer Trinity, we're all about connecting people with Christ and each other. And we have some ways to do that in the coming weeks and months that we'd like to share with you this morning. First, next week our social justice team is sponsoring an educational event regarding guns and gun violence in St. Louis and beyond. Next Sunday on January 22nd at 11.30 a.m., we'll be hosting Gail Wexler, communications lead for the Missouri chapter of Moms Demand Action, who will be talking with us about the plight of gun violence and how we can be part of the solution. Lunch will be provided and all are welcome. Second, as you may or may not know, we have a dedicated group of volunteers who make up our care team. These individuals spend time each week making phone calls, sending cards, and making sure that those members of our community who may be going through a hard time or can't be here physically still feel connected and cared for. If this is something you'd be interested in, um, we, we would encourage you to reach out to Nancy Merrill, our Care and Connections Coordinator. Her contact information can be found on the church website. And lastly, while I know we just finished up 2022 and it's winter and it might seem far off at this moment, summer is just around the corner which means it's time to start thinking about signing up for summer camp. This year, camp will be July 31st through August 4th, and it will be hosted through Heartland Camp. It's a different but very similar organization um, from Eagle Lake, with whom we've worked in the past few years. Registration for campers will launch this week, so be checking your email and the church website for the link to sign up your kiddos since space is limited. Cost and all the things you'll need to know will be on the Concord Kids page of the website. If you want to serve as a volunteer for the camp, even if you can only do a day or two out of that week, reach out to Samantha, our Director of Family Ministry. It's a joy to share this time and space with you. Please take a moment to prepare your hearts for worship as we listen to the prelude.
Will you please stand and join with me in the call to worship? Jesus taught to love our neighbors as ourselves. May we love others and worship as God has intended. Will you please remain standing for our opening hymn? may be seated. Well, good morning, friends. My name is JT. I oversee discipleship and mission here. It's so good to see all of you here this morning. This is a time for us to approach the throne in a posture of prayer. I'll lead us through a brief prayer, and then I'll lead us into the Lord's Prayer, which I invite you to join in with me on the words we printed on the screens up front. Please pray with me. Lord God, we come to you this morning as a people thankful. Thankful for all the blessings that we receive each morning. Thankful for all you have provided us and all the ways you have cared for us. God, we live in this world full of blessings, and yet we can't deny the suffering. We can't deny the pain. We can't deny the death around us. God, as we live in this world of the already and the not yet, we pray that we feel your guidance, that we live and move and have our being in this world in the way that you want to lead us. God, we pray for all of those in our community those in our families, our friends, our co-workers who are in need, those who are in need of healing, 
those who are in need of friendship, those who are in need of love. We pray that they feel your love. They feel your comfort. We pray that they know that you are with them and that we have opportunities to share your love and grace with them. God, we thank you for all you have done for us, all you have done for this faith community. And God, we pray all of this in the name of Jesus, your son, the one who taught us your prayer so long ago, as we say together now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, kiddos, it is time to head off to the Sunday morning gathering. We know you're having tons of fun in the playground, but I'm sure Mr. Michael and Miss Jenny are going to have something super fun for you to do in Sunday morning gathering this morning. While our kiddos are making their way out, I will invite you all to rise as you are able in body and spirit for the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
Good morning. Will you please rise in body and spirit as you are able for today's reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. When the Pharisees heard he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, the expert in the law, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the laws of the prophets. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and redeemer. Amen. So this sermon series is all about who Jesus really was, all the different aspects of his identity that we find in the Gospels. And today, we're talking about Jesus as a theologian. Now, on my better days, I like to think of myself as a theologian kind of like how Joel likes to think of himself as a property manager. It doesn't mean we're any good at it, but we have dreams for it, okay? Now, theologians love to be in dialogue, right? Which is really just a fancy way of saying they love to argue, usually about stuff that doesn't matter. And uh, I thought it would be beneficial to model for you all how theologians usually discuss things. So uh, I wrote up a mock dialogue which I believe accurately captures uh, the essence of how these discussions usually go. I'm going to invite my lovely assistant, uh, Kurt Oakes, up to help me uh, model this for you. Go, Kurt. All right, come on up. Grab that mic for me. All right, here we go. So I'm going to be uh, theologian number one, and Kurt is going to be theologian number two. There you go. All right. All right. Here we go. Everybody ready? Number two. You're number two. Here is my theological idea. Here is my slightly different theological idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My idea is right. No. My idea is right. No, your idea is dumb. <laughs> no, your idea is dumb. 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 Dialogue continues until both theologians die. So, <laughs> everybody give Kurt a hand. Thank you, sir. It's a great vest. Now, that's kind of a vicious feedback loop, isn't it? All right, people who deem themselves experts in a given field don't often like to concede or compromise or allow others to have ideas of their own. They just kind of get pulled away into the undertow of that feedback loop. And that's exactly what the Pharisees in our story wanted this morning. But 
we see that what Jesus says, his response to their question, kind of cuts off that feedback loop at the source. Now, this passage comes amid a series of Jesus' teachings, and in particular, a pattern of him having to deal with being challenged by the religious elders of the day. Right, we catch a glimpse of this in uh, the first couple verses. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Now, this should prompt us to ask some questions. Okay, who are the Pharisees, or who are the Sadducees, and how did Jesus silence them? So, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were both part of the Sanhedrin which is really just another word for the collection or gathering of religious elders of the day. But they're slightly different, right? Even though they get a bad reputation in the Gospels, the Pharisees were actually more of the working people's Jewish leaders, okay? They were around a lot longer. They were pretty heavily trusted by the rank-and-file Jews of the day. The Sadducees, though, they came along a lot later, and they were a lot newer. They had some controversial ideas. They didn't really believe in oral tradition like the Pharisees. They didn't really believe in any kind of an afterlife or resurrection like the Pharisees. Now, I know what you're thinking, and yes, I absolutely agree. The best way to understand these groups is by comparing them to 1990s boy bands. Now, the Pharisees are kind of like the Backstreet Boys, okay? They're tried and true, right? The quintessential religious leaders of the day. Now, the Sadducees, though, were kind of like 98 degrees. Much shorter lived, came along a lot later, but a little bit more bad boy, right? So they're both boy bands, but the Sadducees wore like sleeveless shirts and had tattoos, okay? But when you guys were all at work this week, by the way, this is what I was doing. I was researching 90s boy bands when you guys were actually at your jobs. Now, the Sadducees were another sect of Judaism. In the passage immediately prior to our passage this morning, we see Jesus silence uh, the Sadducees when he gives an answer to this hypothetical question, right? They ask him this hypothetical question about if a woman is married to a man and the man dies and she marries his brother and then the same thing happens five more times, what's going to happen in the resurrection, okay? So we need to bear in mind who's proposed this hypothetical situation. Okay, we need to understand that the Sadducees are Jewish leaders who don't affirm the idea of a resurrection, but they're asking Jesus a question about the resurrection. So clearly, they're trying to expose a weakness in his argument or catch him or trip him up on a technicality or something. And what they say about the law, though, is true. In Deuteronomy 25, it says this, if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as a wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. So their question is essentially, what will happen when all these people rise in the resurrection and all seven of these men expect to be married to the one woman? But Jesus doesn't take that bait. He knows what they're up to. He sees what game they're playing, and he says, no, 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 no. That's a false binary. Right? The resurrection life is not the same as this life. Trying to compare the resurrection life, which is completely different and other, to this life is just kind of meaningless. Right? What the Sadducees are trying to say is that either the law is wrong and the resurrection is true, or the law is correct and the resurrection is a myth. But Jesus doesn't take that path. He takes a third path. Jesus often takes this unnamed third path. My wife loves when I do this. Because, uh, you know, Amy will say, would you rather do the dishes or sweep the floor? And I'll say, how about I just take a nap instead? <laughs> right? I'm just asking myself, what would Jesus do in that situation? Right? <laughs> anyway, Jesus responds like this. The passage says that they were astonished at his teaching, they being the Sadducees. And that brings us up to our passage this morning. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Now, I don't often ask for uh, audience participation, 
And when I have in the past, you all have been huge disappointments to me. But I thought I would, I thought I would give you an opportunity to redeem yourselves. Now, how many laws are in the Old Testament in total? You can shout it out. I won't make fun of you if you're wrong. That's a good guess. It's wrong. Any others? 100, good guess, also wrong. Uh, Lori was close, 613. 613 laws in the Old Testament. So not only are the Pharisees asking Jesus to sift through all 600 plus laws in his mind, but they're trying to catch him on this technicality, right? As soon as Jesus says something, they're gonna try to argue that all the laws are equally important or something like that. But Jesus says something totally unexpected. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is the crux of the entire passage. Love God, love neighbor. And both of these are numbered among those 613 laws in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 6 says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And Leviticus 19 says, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And these may seem straightforward, but they're actually quite uh, complicated and complex, and individually they each have things to teach us. So the first one, We're to love God with all our heart, all our soul, and either might or mind, depending on if we want to go with Deuteronomy 6 or with Jesus' paraphrase. For the sake of our time, we'll go with Jesus' paraphrase and talk about the mind. So, love your God with all your heart, your physical self. Love God with all your soul, your immaterial self. And love God with all your mind, all of your understanding. Now, these are not mutually exclusive. They do not cancel each other out. They need one another. And all of us will fall differently on this spectrum, right? Some of us will be more task-oriented. Some of us will be more introspective. Some will be more intellectual. That's not the issue. The issue is when we try to make one the requirement for all three. So you can't just show up to church, put on a smile, dish out a few Christian side hugs, and call it a day. That's not what it's about. If you're not here for Jesus and you're not here to serve others, you're probably not going to get a whole lot out of this. Physical presence is not everything. Likewise, you can't just have an internal love affair with Jesus. I call this Jesus is my girlfriend Christianity, right? You can't just have an internal love affair with just you and Jesus. That's not the way it works. That kind of faith is meaningless if it's not uh, coupled with the -the on-the-ground work of ministry and works of compassion. And lastly, and this is one thing that I often struggle with, intellectual stimulation is not the same as faith. You can't replace personal piety and ministry in the world with books. You can't replace the study, you can't replace the living God with the study of the living God. That's not the way it works. All three of these things are needed to fulfill the demands of discipleship. Now, on the other side, Loving your neighbor as yourself is twofold, right? Loving neighbor and loving self, right? These also need each other, but we often don't take both of them as seriously, right? We put a lot of emphasis on loving neighbor, but very little emphasis on loving self. And don't get me wrong, if we're going to put an emphasis on one over the other, I think it should be on loving your neighbor. But according to the law, the model for loving others is the love of yourself. And that's not something we're very, we're conditioned to be very good at. And part of that is because of our context, right? We're in America, where we're taught to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, where we're taught that our worth is tied to our labor and how much we work, right? That kind of mentality can kill people, and it has. And we need to do everything we can to keep it at arm's length from the gospel. But we also often get this kind of rugged individualism from our faith, right? We, we're, more, uh, we're willing to extend grace to one another, 
We're willing to extend grace to somebody else, but very rarely do we extend grace to ourselves. We're more than willing to comfort somebody in their moment of doubt, but we often don't do that when we have doubts. In my experience working with the church and working with Christians, there's a lot of things that we are not very good at, but loving ourselves is often one of the things at the top of the list. And when I say loving ourselves, that's, I don't, self-love is not self-absorption. Those are two different things. But what I'm talking about is recognizing your inner worth purely because you exist. Your inner value as a beloved creation and child of God, that you're deserve to live a loved and dignified life, period. No qualifiers needed. When you realize that about yourself, then you can start realizing it about other people. Now, coming back to our text, Jesus brings these two commandments together and makes one delicious biblical cocktail, okay? One super commandment. And here is where his genius as a theologian really starts to shine. Right, the two commandments Jesus brings together, love God and love neighbor, are the complete summation of the life of discipleship. And that alone is brilliant. But look at this. Okay, these are our ten commandments. Okay, amid the 600 plus commandments in the Old Testament, these are the foundation. Right, these are the timeless laws that don't change based on the Israelites' culture or context. Right? These are basics. If you were an Israelite and you weren't on board with these, then you had bigger problems. Okay? But now watch what happens when we split them in half. Okay? We get two sets. And this is often how they're depicted in art. It's aesthetically nice because they're nice and similar. There's five on each side, yada, yada, yada. But there's actually so much more going on here. All right? So let's look at the list on the left. Right? You shall have no other gods before me. Right? Yahweh is the only one who should be worshipped, okay? You shall not make idols, pretty self-explanatory, no idol worship. Do not take the Lord's name in vain, okay? Don't swear an oath with Yahweh's name and then go back on it. Keep the Sabbath, right? Maintain the rhythm of life that Yahweh has established. And number five, honor your father and mother. Our parents are our models for God, and they are to be uh, respected and treated as such. Now, let's look at the second half, the half on the right, right? You shall not murder, pretty straightforward. Don't commit adultery, pretty obvious. Don't steal, pretty obvious. Don't bear false witness, don't lie. And you shall not covet, okay? Don't get carried away with jealousy. Now, these are all way more complicated, culturally and otherwise, than I just made them out to be. But look at how these are broken up. The first five, the ones on the left, deal with Yahweh and how people should relate to Yahweh and Yahweh's role in the lives of the Israelites. And the second half deal with one another, deal with the people in the community. In other words, the first five deal with loving God. The second five deal with loving your neighbor, which is exactly what Jesus spells out in our passage as the greatest commandment. Now, this is all that's going to be said at the moment about these commandments. After this, Jesus moves on and starts arguing with the Pharisees about something else. But in a few chapters, in Matthew 25, Jesus will launch into a teaching that has continued to be motivation and inspiration for the church for millennia. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. What Jesus will eventually teach in the Gospels to his disciples, and eventually, ultimately, to us, is that loving God and loving others aren't two distinct acts. They're one and the same. When we love each other, when we serve the poor, when we stand in solidarity with communities who are experiencing injustice and oppression, we are loving God. Because God isn't some superhuman who lives in the clouds in some metaphysical construct. God is here and exists among us. 
exist among communities here on earth, the communities of the least of these of this world. If we want to find God, we shouldn't be trying to find him in the sky or in the sanctuary or in a book. We should try to find him in one another, particularly in those who are suffering. And our job is to be constantly trying to point to him in our service in the way we love. That's why we've invested time and resources in building up our community service team and our social justice team. That's why our Concord co-ops are expected to be always engaging their community. Because serving those who are without. Loving our neighbor, loving the other, is the very act and essence of loving God. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, when Samantha, our director of family, family ministry preached on New Year's Day, she talked a bit about resolutions. And I'm sure that at least for some of us here this morning, that resolution was to grow in our Christian faith and get more plugged into this particular faith community. And one very concrete, practical way we can do that is by electing to give a financial gift or offering to the church just as we invest consistency into other spiritual disciplines like prayer and reading the Bible, so does this particular spiritual discipline require consistency. When we regularly give to the church, not only does it impact the church and its ministries, but it impacts us and makes us a more generous and sacrificial people. We're so grateful to those who have demonstrated this depth of generosity through giving, as well as those who continue to do so or might be considering it for the first time. If you feel moved to give and support the ministries of our faith community this morning, you can do so through the mail or online at our website. You can scan the QR code and give right from your phones, or you can place it in the baskets as they're passed. I invite the ushers to come forward now.
Will you pray with me? Holy Father, you are a generous and loving God, and out of your great mercy, you have given us so much. We give you this offering today. With it, we worship you and give our whole selves to you. Please accept it and use it for your kingdom and your glory. Amen. Just last night, I uh, stumbled upon an article <laughs> entitled, Why Are There So Many Angry Theologians? And in it, there was this little passage, and it said this, As theologians rage, their zeal is aimed at one another. Instead of linking arms to pursue the Great Commission as fellow laborers, they engage in friendly fire, participating in a made-up war in which no one wins. I don't know about you, but I have no interest in taking part in a made-up war. That's exactly what the Pharisees wanted in our passage. And what was Jesus' response? Love God and love people, period. If other churches want to bicker about theology and never venture outside the walls of their sanctuary, then fine. But somebody, some church, has to go out and love the people of South County until it hurts. Why not us? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs> 